You want to lead them Kirtan for a little while, Kirtan? Could you lead a little Kirtan? Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Dasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chatur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripasindu Paivata Patita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibyo Namo Nama Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pasyacha Dejatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're continuing uh, to present this first chapter of the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And we heard how Sukadeva Goswami replied to Maharaj Parikshit's question. Maharaj Parikshit had asked, What is the duty of one who is about to die? And what is the duty of all people at all time? And he also wanted to know, What should they hear and chant? 
what should they do and what should they not do. So in reply to the question by Maharaj Parikshit, Sukadeva Goswami began by first of all congratulating him on asking such a, an appropriate question. And then Sukadeva Goswami went on first of all to describe some things which we should not do, at, particularly at that point when you're about to leave the body. You don't want to be thinking about uh, material attachments, about the different objects of this material world which uh, are meant for just for our sense gratification. But we need to detach ourselves from everything material. So Sukadeva Goswami spoke about how there are two kinds of householders. There's a grihasta who are engaged in spiritual activities in the ashram and there are the Grihamedis. And Sukadeva Goswami spoke about the nature of the Grihamedis, how they they just simply work all the time, they're just simply anxious to get more and more to accumulate the resources of the material world. They want more and more money and they want to have more and more sense gratification. So Sukadeva Goswami then went on to speak about what they should be doing and he spoke particularly about the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. And this is recommended by all of the authorities, the chanting of the Lord's holy name. So last night we were speaking about the the proper attitude in chanting the holy name, that we should take it as something which is very important in our spiritual life and we should put a lot of effort and energy into chanting the holy name. We, you can see here, uh, what would you do, what would you do outside of your 16 rounds? that, that uh, nourishes your japa. And so what you can do outside of the 16 rounds that nourishes your japa, we do things like worshipping the deity and then also studying the scriptures, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. These are activities which will help to nourish our japa. Also taking part in Sankirtan. When there is a Sankirtan program, we should like to join because we get more taste for Japa the more we take part in activities like Sankirtan. And then we ask, what do you do outside of your 16 rounds that hinders your Japa? Well, there are quite a few things which hinder our japa. One of them is that mobile phone, which we all have, of course. It's a good idea, you know, when we're doing our japa, to keep the mobile phone far away. You know, if you hold your bead bag in one hand and your mobile phone in the other hand, it's not very good. It's not the proper way. We really, the best thing you can do is put your mobile phone away, turn it off or something. You know, chanting japa is more important than any kind of what's coming in your WhatsApp or your everything else, all the other apps which you have. So that's a big hindrance. And then other things which also hinder our japa talking in the middle of our japa, not a good idea. You really want to get in, immersed into chanting japa. You try to make it a policy that we don't talk when we do japa, that we just simply chant. So talking is a problem, the mobile phones are a problem. I mean, also the time and the place where you do your japa 
can also hinder your chapa. Try to chant at home, especially if you're a parent and you have children, young children, they will need your attention. So you cannot expect that you can chant and at the same time take care of your child very well. Because ch children need, they need attention. So it's a good idea, you want to chant, you want to chant when the child is sleeping or when the child is away at school. When you have time to be alone, then you can absorb yourself more in chanting japa. So there are many things which hinder our japa and there are many things which can nourish our japa. So we have to, we have to be intelligent to understand how to properly practice the chanting of the holy name. Generally, we encourage the devotees try, try to chant in the morning and particularly early morning is recommended. Although Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says in the Shikshastikam, he says, there are no hard and fast rules in chanting the holy name. So he's saying, you know, you can chant anytime in any place, but some time and some places are better and easier than other times. If we do take advantage of the morning hours, we'll find that it's much easier to sit and to concentrate on chanting the holy name. You don't have to sit, you can walk around also, that's also not bad. And Srila Prabhupada would generally like to go for a japa walk in the morning. And even, I think it's uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he recommends also you can go for a japa walk and chant the holy name. So the acharyas are also chanting and walking. But it's important, try to chant, do the chanting. So, next slide goes on to talk about dealing with blasphemy because one of the problems in chanting the holy name is that we should chant without offence. And the first offence is to blaspheme devotees who have dedicated themselves to chanting the holy name. So. We have to understand the importance of not committing any blasphemy. Blaspheming a devotee means to criticize someone because of their, maybe, maybe because of their birth, it may be because of something which they did in the past before becoming a devotee, maybe something from their background. In some way, if we, if we criticize a person on the basis of these kind of things, then this is blasphemy, this is offensive. And it's that kind of offense is very harmful for our Krishna consciousness. So as I said, when we're chanting, we don't want, it's not a good idea to converse, to have a, try to talk to people in between your japa. And generally when people talk to each other, they, will, they like to talk about other people. So that becomes prajalpa, becomes a blasphemy. So here we're warned about this, it, it's something serious because it can damage our creeper of devotion. So we have to know how to deal with these things. So. Uh, quoting from the Markandeya Purana, uh, Sri Goswami Ji says that one should neither blaspheme the, dev the devotee of the Lord nor indulge in hearing others who are engaged in belittling a devotee of the Lord. A devotee should not, a devotee should try to restrict the 
a, a devotee should try to restrict the vilifier by cutting out his tongue. And being unable to do so, one should commit suicide rather than hear blaspheming of the devotee of the Lord. So, you know, the, these are very extreme measures, of course. Uh, a devotee, you know, to cut out someone's tongue, uh, it's uh, not recommended, right? Although it's maybe written here in the Bible, but that's not the, the kind of thing which we want to encourage devotees. Devotees should try to restrict the vilifier by, no, we don't want to do that. Being unable to do that, one should commit suicide. That's also not recommended, right? We don't want to be killing a brahmana. You might be a brahmana, you know, and if you commit suicide then you're guilty of an offence of killing a brahmana. So what, what of course we should do we, is we should leave that place. We shouldn't want to hear this kind of talking. Rather, we must immediately leave the place, go away and chant the holy name, absorb ourselves in chanting the holy name. So hearing is important. So three ways of dealing with such insults. If someone is heard blaspheming by words, one should be so expert that he can defeat the opposing party by argument. That's difficult to do. You want to argue with someone and prove that they were wrong, that they're making an offence, that they shouldn't say this. If you try to argue with them, it will be difficult. And because Kali Yuga, people don't like to admit that they're wrong. They always think, no, I'm right, you're wrong. And this way you go on arguing. So just simply arguing and trying to defeat someone is not really recommended. It's difficult. So if we are unable to defeat the opposing party, then the next step is that he should not just stand there meekly, but he should give up his life. And that's also not recommended. The third process is followed. If he is unable to execute the above-mentioned two processes, that is, one must leave the place, go away. If a devotee does not follow any of the above-mentioned three processes, he falls down from the position of devotee. So it's very crucial for us to uh, not hear criticism of devotees. There's a nice example of uh, how a devotee would change the subject. It's about Bamsi Das Babaji, who was uh, connected with Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada. So there was one Bamsi Das Babaji. And if somebody would say to him, what do you think of the government? He would say, Govardhan. In other words, he would not hear the name government. He would just simply hear Govardhan. So he would, could, he would change the subject. He would not want to speak about the government because it's not the business of the sadhu really to talk about governments. Rather, we want to talk about Govardhan. So Vamsi Das Babaji could do these kind of things. We should also try to become so expert that somebody may be talking something unpalatable. Try to change the subject matter or else just simply cover your ears and go away. That's the best thing to do. Get away from the place. Don't remain to hear the uh, bad, un unpleasant things. So here we talk about offending devotees, that, that's important. We don't want to be guilty of that because it, it, as I said, it's a mad elephant offence and it destroys the creeper of devotion. So we ask, who are you offending? So if we're offending somebody who's a devotee, 
Well, that's serious. You know, someone's a devotee, they're, you say, oh, he's not a devotee, he's just tr pretending to be a devotee. So then it becomes blasphemy. We shouldn't criticize people like that. Uh, we want to be cautious about it. What is causing you to make offenses or be critical of this devotee? Why are we often critical of someone? The problem is usually our own false ego. That, that because of our own false ego, we, we don't like someone or we, and we feel offended by someone and we make criticisms about them. So what attitude was, must we adopt to stop being critical? Well, the attitude should be that because I'm a fallen soul myself, I'm seeing faults in others. So I have to look at my own faults rather than just look at the faults of others. That's one thing which we could do. And what should you change within yourself? What should you change within yourself to adopt these proper attitudes? We should change that, that mentality of fault-finding, of looking at other faults. We should change that mentality and try to look at our own faults and don't be critical of others. Rather, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taught us amanena manadena, that we should offer all respects to others and not be anxious for any respect for ourselves. So that should be the attitude of the devotee. We want to remember Lord Chaitanya's instructions in these matters and he has taught us to always offer respects to others and not to be anxious for respect for ourselves. And in that way then we can go on chanting the holy name of the Lord constantly. Because of our offenses against devotees we lose the taste to chant the holy name ourselves. We have no taste for the holy name because we have criticized other devotees. So we have to be very careful, try to understand how to properly appreciate devotees, to see good in devotees and in this way we'll have more taste ourselves also for chanting the holy name. All right, so the conclusion is you should not hear and you should not allow vilification of the devotees of the Lord. Don't encourage it. If we stay to hear it, then that's encouraging it. Okay, so we'll just go through this. Oh. All right, so we're hearing Maharaj Parikshit, uh, his question being answered by Sukadeva Goswami. And Sukadeva Goswami gave the example about Maharaj Gatvanga. Maharaj Gatvanga was a great king who went to fight for the demigods against the demons. And Maharaj Gatvanga fought so nicely the demigods were very grateful to him and they wanted to award him some benediction. So it happened that Kartikeya was coming and Kartike, when Kartikeya came to take over, then Kadvanga Maharaj was told, you can have a rest now because Kartikeya is here and he will fight. And so the demigods told Kadvanga Maharaj, you can have a blessing from us. What blessing can we give you to repay you for all of your a service which you've done for us, fighting against these demons. So Kadvanga Maharaj asked, just simply tell me how long I have left in this world. And the demigods told him, you only have a moment's time left. So Maharaj Kadvanga immediately brought himself from the heavenly planets down to the earthly abode, to this planet, and he sat and fixed his mind on the Lord. 
and in this way he gave up his body. So Garbhanga Maharaj was given as an example by Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami was telling this to Maharaj Parikshit because Maharaj Parikshit may be worried that I don't have enough time to get myself ready for leaving the world. Maharaj Parikshit had been cursed to die in seven days. So he may have been worried that, have I really got enough time to be able to prepare myself properly for leaving the world? So Sukadeva Goswami cited this example of Garbhanga Maharaj, that Garbhanga Maharaj had only one moment, but he was able to do it. He was able to be successful. So it doesn't have to take a long time. But we have to remember that Garvanga Maharaj had prepared himself. If you have not prepared yourself throughout the life, then at the moment of death, then we will, if we hear we only have a moment, then certainly we will panic because we have not properly prepared ourselves. But Garvanga Maharaj had cultivated the mood of detachment. He had gone there to the heavenly planets prepared to give his life in the service of the demigods. He knew it was a great risk to go up there to the heavenly planets and to fight the asuras. But Karvanga Maharaj in the mood of the Kshatriya was prepared to sacrifice his life in the service of others. So when he heard he only had a moment left to live, it was not very challenging for him. He could immediately fix his mind on the Lord and give up his body. So this way Sukadeva Goswami is encouraging Maharaj Parikshit that he only had a moment, you have seven days to prepare yourself. So Sukadeva Goswami begins to explain the process of mystic yoga by which one may achieve the auspicious destination. The preliminary stage of this process involves meditation on the universal form as described in the second half of this first chapter. So there are, uh, Sukadeva Goswami begins the, the, this second canto in the Srimad Bhagavatam by describing how to think of the Lord because the instruction was given, you have to absorb your mind and thinking of the Lord. So how to think of Him? Now not everyone will accept the form of the Deity. Not everyone will have the clear vision that who is the Lord and what is his form. There will be different opinions and different ideas, what we should think of, what, should, what form we should visualize and how we should visualize. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing progressive stages of realization of the Lord. This first chapter is called The First Steps in Self-Realization and he's describing how by mystic yoga you can think of the Lord in the form of the universal form, the Virata Rup. And how to do that is going to be described in this Srimad Bhagavatam here. Oh. So Sukadeva Goswami describes about renunciation and the mechanical process of meditation for neophytes. You can, well, we're neophytes, right? <laughs> we're all neophytes. So is this for us? Well, different, for different people, there are different processes. It's understood that these neophytes who are being instructed in the mechanical process of 
uh, renunciation that they are not, they don't have the association of the devotee to guide them and they're they're completely newcomers and so we understand there are different steps just like in the Bhagavad Gita Lord Krishna described the yoga ladder now Lord Krishna spoke about karma yoga and then jnana yoga and then jnana yoga he didn't just speak only about bhakti yoga of course bhakti was the highest that was the ultimate but Lord Krishna gave instructions on the other yogas also so similarly in Srimad Bhagavatam Sukadeva Goswami is presenting a progressive approach to understanding the Lord and he's beginning with contemplating the Lord in the form of the universal form, the Virata Rup. The second chapter will go on to describe the Lord as the Super Soul, as a Paramatma and how we can meditate on the Lord as Paramatma. And then in the third chapter he will talk about the Lord in his original form as Bhagavan Sri Krishna as the personality of Godhead. So Sukadeva Goswami is going to describe the process of meditation on the universal form and we'll hear how he contemplate how we can contemplate that universal form. So we mentioned here about developing spiritual desires. We have to have the desire for self-realization, spiritual desires. We want to go, we understand we all have desires. So we want to develop the higher desires, the desires for spirituality, not just the desire for sense gratification, for the, the taking care of the material body, but cultivating desires which will bring us back to Godhead, which will bring us into the association of the Supreme Lord. This is important for us. So Prabhupada writes about this, you can see there we put in the bold letters, one cannot therefore stop desiring but the subject matter must be changed. Right? We must change the subject matter. Instead of desiring just for our own bodily comforts, we want to desire for our spiritual perfection. That desire must be there. You can see, <laughs> we hear, what about those who for various reasons are unable to chant. Unfortunately, we do have people like that, that un they just say, oh, I just can't chant, oh, I <laughs> They have their reasons, they're not able to chant. What to do about it? So, those who are not able to chant the name, are recommended they can chant Omkara. This is a mechanical process for training the mind in self-realization. Allen Ginsberg was one of the men who helped Prabhupada in the very beginning. Allen Ginsberg had been to India and <laughs> he was when he, he, he met Prabhupada and he was telling Prabhupada how he chanted Om and Prabhupada told him we chant Hare Krishna and he also, Allen Ginsberg also chanted Hare Krishna but he said I like Om. Anyway, meditation on the limbs of the form of Vishnu is better than impersonal omkara meditation. Generally the people who chant Om are impersonalists and they do not recognize the transcendental form of the Lord. 
Krishna does say in the Bhagavad Gita, Pranavam Vedeshu, that I am the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. So Om is a representation of Lord Krishna. But generally the people who are chanting Om, they're simply thinking that the, the ultimate is without form. And Om is just the sound. They think Om, the, the sound is the supreme. They don't believe that there's a spiritual form. So you can meet people like that, many people actually chanting. Sometimes it's easier to introduce people to chant Om. Like it, if you have to teach a yoga class, maybe you have to go into a college or something and they tell you cannot chant Hare Krishna, right? Somebody was telling me that Sometimes you, we have programs like that and you're not allowed to say Hare Krishna to anybody. And so that you can say Om. If you say Om, oh, the, oh that's okay. You say Om. You say Hare, Hare Krishna, oh that's a religion. You know, they don't, that's a cult or whatever. They don't like it, you know. They feel worried, they feel threatened if you say Hare Krishna. But if you say Om, Om, they will say, oh very, yes, very nice. Very spiritual. Hare Krishna, oh no, no, that's not spiritual. We have these difficulties. People are often very prejudiced and sometimes difficult. All right, uh, Srila Prabhupada writes, Foolish people, bewildered by the essential energy of Vishnu, do not know that the ultimate goal of the progressive search after happiness is to get in touch directly with Lord Vishnu, the Personality of Godhead. Foolish people don't know. They're busy. They're thinking the happiness, the ultimate happiness is in wealth or is in the, the, the material pleasures. They do not know what is real happiness. So it's pointed out here, the real happiness is to get directly in touch with Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna. So how to do that? for materialistic people who cannot accept the form of the Lord in the deity. So there's a form of, there's a philosophical system which is called pantheism. Hmm? Prabhupada explains here, the neophyte impersonalist is given a chance to realize the relation of the Lord in everything by the philosophy of pantheism. Pantheism, to see everything in the world, the objects of the world, in relation with God. So we'll hear how we can do that just in a little while. You can see great mountains and so on. You can feel something of the, the power, the energy of God just through the form of nature. So how to prepare oneself for the yoga process? Just like if you do Ashtanga Yoga, it's talked about in the Bhagavad Gita, Ashtanga Yoga, there are different progressive stages by which one concentrates the mind. And you begin with uh, yam and niyam. There are things which you do and which you shouldn't do. So similarly also in the mystic yoga process, there are things you should do. And it's mentioned here, the first stage is to practice brahmacharya, practice strict control of the mind and senses. And then the second thing you should do is bathing in the holy places. Just like you go to the Himalayas, you know, you go up there, you know, the, the holy places, you, you want to take bath in these holy places. 
it's you can read about uh, Kapila Muni, Dhruva Maharaj, what they were doing, Devahuti, what she was doing. Devahuti was bathing every day in, in the in the that Kund, Bindu Saroba, and uh, Dhruva Maharaj also. He was bathing every day under the instructions of Narada Muni three times a day. So this is things, you know, things, there are things you don't do, like what you don't do, you don't have connection with the other sex, and then what you have to do, you have to bathe in the holy places. So the yam and niyam is there, and then the next thing, uh, sitting on the asana made according to the rule, according to the rules of cooking. You have the deer skin and the cloth, and this this is prepared. This is asana, getting ready, and then asana, and then pranayama, chanting the three syllables combined as Om, representing the fourth stage pranayama. So yam niyam asan pranayama. This is yoga, and then after pranayama, then you come to prajahara. So controlling the mind, withdraw the senses, this is the fifth stage, pratyahara, withdrawing the senses, just like the turtle draws his limbs within, under the shell. So like that, pratyahara, you're not looking around, you're not worried about what's in front of you or around you, you're contemplating within. This is the fifth stage of the yoga process, pratyahara. And then dharana, again increase the mind whose assistant is the intelligence which di discriminates and then concentrate with intelligence on the form of the Lord. So after prajahara then you start to think about the form of the Lord and then comes dhyana, one should meditate on the individual limbs of the Lord and that brings you to the final stage which is samadhi. So this is the perfection of the yoga system to come to that stage of samadhi, engaging the mind which has no contact with the sense objects and one should not think of anything else. So you can understand that system of yoga is not for this age, but that was a system, particularly in the Satya Yuga when people lived a very long time. In the Satya Yuga people lived 100,000 years, they lived for one lakh. And you can read about Kardama Muni, how he was doing Astanga Yoga for 10,000 years. And the Lord came to him and the Lord said, yeah, uh, you're going to get a wife and the girl's coming, you should accept her. And in this way, uh, Kardama Muni was married to Devahuti, accepted Devahuti. But preliminary was 10,000 years of Astanga Yoga to purify the mind. So then we come to contemplating the universal form. How to contemplate? What's the benefit of being aware of the universal form? Just being aware of the universal form. So these dirty things of fruitive work and empiric philosophy can be removed only by association with the Supreme Lord. The Lord being omnipotent can offer his association by his inconceivable potencies. Thus persons who are unable to pin their faith on the personal feature of the Absolute are given a chance to associate with his virata root or the cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord. 
The cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord is a feature of his unlimited potencies. Since the potent and potencies are identical, even the conception of his impersonal cosmic features helps a conditioned soul to associate with the Lord indirectly and thus gradually come to the stage of personal contact. So Prabhupada is explaining to us how you, the benefit of this contemplating the universal form. Not everybody is able to accept deity worship. This is a problem. It's difficult for some people. They just have a barrier to it. Oh no, I cannot accept this. Is a, these are just dolls or these are just idols or whatever. So, contemplating the universal form, it's also there in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. You have Arjuna asking Lord Krishna to show that universal form. And Prabhupada explains there, it's a challenge to the atheists. So similarly here, the Viratarup manifestation of the Lord is simultaneously a challenge to the atheists. It's a challenge to them. Why? Because they may say there's no God. But then, okay, well, here is God, look, there's the form, there's the universal form. He has a form, this is, you're showing them a form. You cannot say there's no God, this form is God. So it's a challenge to them. And it's also a favor for the Asuras. It's a favor to the Asuras who can think of the Lord as Virat and thus gradually cleanse the dirt from their hearts in order to become qualified to actually see the transcendental form of the Lord in his real feature. This is a favour of the all-merciful Lord to the atheists and the gross materialists, gross materialistic people. They, they, they need to have some way in which they can understand God. So, through the objects of the material world. So, Prabhupada explains this is for neophyte people who have no understanding of transcendental knowledge or of spiritual forms. So, they're unfortunate souls. So, how can they understand God? They're given this opportunity. Common man, Prabhupada says, common man has no love for Krishna and cannot always think of Krishna. Therefore, he has to think materially. Because materialists cannot understand Krishna spiritually, they are advised to they are advised to concentrate the mind on physical things and try to see how Krishna is manifest by physical representations. And we see that in the Bhagavad Gita, in the particularly the 10th chapter, Vibhuti Yoga, Lord Krishna gives a long list of different ways in which he is present in the material world. I am the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras, I am the sound in ether, I am the ability in man, of flowing rivers I am the Ganga, of beasts I am the lion, of immovable things I am Mount Meru, or, or, or I am the Himalayas, of mountains I am Meru. So many different ways Lord Krishna describes how we can think of Krishna in the form of the objects of the material world. Sometimes Prabhupada would say, who can say they have not seen God? God, the light, God says, I am the light of the sun and the moon. Everyone has seen the light of the sun and the moon. How can you say you have not seen God? 
So this, the, these examples are given for materialistic people to understand how they can see God. And then Prabhupada also said, all such descriptions are for the neophyte. Neophytes cannot conceive of anything beyond matter. The, the material conception of the Lord is not counted in the list of his factual forms. So, the whole purpose of understanding the universal form, Prabhupada stresses, is to develop the service attitude. If they don't have a service attitude, then it is useless. So you can see the difference that all of you here, you have a service attitude. You have the mood to serve Krishna. But these unfortunate people who contemplate the universal form, they have to come to that stage of developing the service attitude. We come to Krishna Consciousness because we're eager to do service. We like the idea of having service to do. It's a great blessing for us and we like to do it. Here you can see the material body. It, it's like the elements of the material nature are all there in that one body. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. And you can see the soul there is also represented with the spirit soul. So this is a graphical, a pictorial representation of a universal form. Persons who have realized it have, have, have studied that the planets known as Patala constitute the bottom of the feet of the Universal Lord and the heels and the toes are the, are the Rasatala planets, the ankles are the Mahatala planets and the shanks constitute Talatala planets. So these are all planets in the bottom of the universe and they're compared to different limbs of the body of the Lord. And you go, as you go up, higher up, you come up to the higher planets. So the top you have Satya Loka, Brahma Loka, Patala Loka, Maha Loka, not Patala Loka, Maha Loka, Jana Loka, Tapo Loka. They're all at the top. They represent the head of the body. Here, uh, varieties of birds are indications of his ma masterful artistic state. We all appreciate nature, the beauty of nature. So we're encouraged to see who is behind nature, whose nature is being presented. So here you see the beauty of the, the swan, the, the grace of the swan, the artistic design there in the, the body of the swan. It's an indication of the masterful artistic sense of the Creator, the Supreme Lord. And then the ocean is his waist and the hills and the mountains are stacks of his bones. You can see everything, all the different features of this cosmic manifestation they're all there within the body of the Supreme Lord. The rivers are the veins of, of, of the gigantic body. The trees are the hairs of his body. And the, and the omnipotent air is his breath. So rivers, flowing rivers, they're like the veins of the body of the Lord and the trees are the hair. And then clouds which carry water are 
the hairs on his head. The termination of days and nights are his dress and the supreme cause of material creation is his intelligence. His mind is the moon, the reservoir of all changes. Everything in the creation, it's all there. It all represents some particular feature of the body of the Supreme Lord. So when we are contemplating the Lord, we can think of him in this way. The moon, the here is described as the mind. We're affected. When there's a full moon, then sometimes some people they have a they're very disturbed sometimes. Some people have difficulty with their minds. I remember I was I was staying in our temple in Brooklyn in New York in the nineteen seventies. And I remember on full moon nights, the, some people would, always on the full moon nights, people would just come and they'd just be banging, banging on the doors, beating on the door of the temple. Because if it's a full moon night, somehow they just go crazy. You know, the, the moon affects people's minds. So, everything is related to the form of the Lord. So, is it universal form, is it material, transcendental or imaginary? So there are different references you can study. Mm -hmm. What is the universal form? Described here, the Supreme Personality of Godhead by His partial representation uh, measuring not more than nine inches as super soul expands by his personal energy in the shape of the universal form which includes everything manifested in different categories of in different varieties of organic and inorganic material. Is it real or imaginary? There are quotations here by Srila Prabhupada. The Virata universal form of the Absolute is an imagination of the speculative philosophers who are unable to adjust to the eternal two-handed form of Lord Sri Krishna. Although the universal form as imagined by the great philosophers is one of the features of the Lord, it is more or less imaginary. And then the Virata Rup is not therefore an eternal form of the Lord. Like when the Lord has avatars in this world, the different avatars which appear like Lord Varaha, Lord Nishingadev, Lord Vaman, they are all eternal forms of the Lord. But the Virata Rup is not like that, it's not an eternal form, it's a temporary material manifestation. It is merely the temporary imaginary resemblance of his personal form within the kingdom of Maya. And then the Virata Rupa or universal form is an imaginary form to help the gross materialist gradually understand the presence of the personality of Godhead. Now, the form which Arjuna saw, however, which is described in Bhagavad Gita, is a little different. That form seen by Arjuna is a manifestation of Krishna's universal potency. The form is contained within Krishna's two-armed form. So that's a difference they accept. Only the pure devotees can see that form. A devotee is not much interested in the universal form because it does not enable one 
to reciprocate loving feelings. No, Arjuna was Arjuna he didn't feel any awakening of devotion seeing that form. He asked Krishna to show his original form. Those who are impersonalists and also imagining that they are seeing the universal form of the Lord. But from Bhagavad Gita we understand that the impersonalists are not devotees. Therefore, they are unable to see the universal form of the Lord. Some people are imagining their seeing. The Virata Rup exists and is all pervading. However, the Lord shows that form only to whom He chooses. Finally, here's a quote here. Uh, the universal form is also considered personal. Malati, Prabhupada's disciple, Mataji, she said, What class of impersonalists are worshipping the universal form? And Prabhupada replies, Well, universal form is not impersonal. That is personal. That is also manifestation of Krishna. And Malati said, but you say that in one of your purports you are saying that the impersonalists are worshipping the universal form. So Prabhupada said, they are advised. And Shamsundar, Malati's husband, said, ah, advised to worship. In other words, Prabhupada said, the impersonalists are encouraged, they are being advised to worship, but usually they don't. Okay, so that's the end. Are there any questions? Marichi Prima, any question tonight? That um, it's not a good practice to see faults in others, and rather better to see faults in ourselves. And the how to bring with faults that you see you know, um, in the daily life. You, know, you see faults in families, of course, many faults in the bodies also sometimes, you know. As you mentioned, sometimes you see someone chanting with the mobile or someone maybe say something which is uh, wrongly considered you know, how to say, so any kind of fault, you know, how, how to deal with this, uh, with this fault? Yeah. Well, one thing is to, to be an example ourselves. That, you know, people are doing something which they shouldn't do, so we don't want to do it ourselves. Try to show the example to others. As you say, people are uh, maybe chanting with their mobile phone. You don't want to do that yourself. And also talking about it. Maybe not directly coming, Prabhu, you know, you shouldn't be chanting like this. But bringing it up in a general, uh, in, a, in a public forum, bringing it up in the assembly of devotees so that everybody can hear at the same time, not just picking on one person that, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, but, you know, speaking about these things in front of the assembly of devotees, so that the devotees themselves can be made conscious and made aware of what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. As far as uh, people talking something which, saying something which is not correct and maybe they've got Prabhupada wrong or something, that's a more delicate subject matter and you have to be careful about dealing with people. We have to consider also 
What is our relationship with that person? Does he accept you as an authority figure? If you're not the authority figure for him, then it will be difficult to try to instruct them. Right? If we're, if we're in a, a junior position, we don't want to try to give instruction to somebody who's our senior. That's not right. And, and even if we are senior, but if that person doesn't respect you as an authority, then it will be very difficult to try to give them instruction. They may not like it. Therefore, I say that one of the ways in which we can present these things to people is by uh, talking about them. You know, some, we do things like have Easter ghosties and uh, have hmm, devotees, sadhu sangha coming together with the devotees and just talking and discussing, sometimes even in classes, bringing it up in classes that these things shouldn't be done what should be done, what is the proper standard, and what is right, what, would, what did Prabhupada say, what did Prabhupada not say. <laughs> so, trying to do it in a manner which is not, con not uh, con too much controversial, presenting in a, in a manner which is easier for people to digest. So that's my response to your question, Prabhu. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu? Uh, doing wrong, wrong things, uh, not the proper, uh, not the own production standards. Uh, even though there's a thing and you just keep it quiet, not doing anything, is it uh, offense? Is it all right to what? Is it uh, an offense? Because uh, sometimes you don't have to do it wrong, but you are doing it wrong. Uh -huh. So you just say, uh, no, there's a good of uh, what it is. Uh, so is it that you don't have to do it wrong, and you are doing something wrong, and you are doing something wrong? Is it an offense? Well, you have to consider what is your relationship with them, you know? What is your, what is your position? They say, authority, uh, are you the authority figure? Are you the person in charge? And like that. We don't want to, sometimes it's, you don't want to get involved in something, you know, which is, but you can report it. If you're not the authority figure, then you report it to somebody who is. And you take it, you know, you just report it to the people who are actually responsible for that particular uh, situation for them to bring it to their attention and see what they have to say rather than doing something ourselves. When we do, we do something ourselves, it may come against us that, oh, who are you? Why you did this? You know, you, who, you know, you don't have, you're not the authority, you're not the manager, what's it got to do with you? So it's always better, you know, to check with other people and particularly somebody who's maybe in a higher position, a more senior person, and ask them, what do you think, what should we do, what should be done? Rather than just doing something independently on our own, but, but bringing it up to others' attention. And then there's, if they all agree that it's wrong, then there's strength in numbers. But if you just try to do something yourself, then it won't be appreciated. But if you have the support from that devotee community that this is wrong, that this has to be corrected, then it will be much more effective and you'll be able to do really uh, make some changes. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.
ಸೊನ್ನೆ